Hi, HR Nation. It's Chris Rainey. Welcome to HR Leaders, the show where we interview today's most successful and innovative HR practitioners. Today's guest is Steve Deegan. Steve is the Chief HR Officer of Nestle Purina North America. Steve, welcome to the show. Good to be here. Thank you for the opportunity. It's my first podcast, so uh, I guess you're giving me a bucket list opportunity, Chris. <laughs> Thank you. Thank you. Well, I feel I feel honoured that you chose us. <laughs> um, Mutual. Steve, <laughs> thanks, Steve. Tell HR leaders a little bit more about yourself and uh, your journey to becoming the chief HR officer at Nestle Purina. Okay, sure. Uh, Nestle Purina in North America. It's it's located here in the Midwest in St. Louis in the United States, home of this world champion St. Louis Cardinals. We're hoping for a good uh, <laughs> season this year. Still hope. Um, I grew up in the northeast of the United States. Um, we moved around a little bit in my family. Uh, ultimately, I, I went to university in uh, Philadelphia, great institution called LaSalle University. Uh, I was actually an officer in the Army for a few years after that, going through ROTC uh, while at school. And uh, post-Army, I, I really landed at Nestle. It was my first job after the military. And uh, so I've been around 26 years. Uh, it's, you could say I had a standard big company kind of career. It didn't feel that way to me because uh, I moved around quite a bit early on. I started out in manufacturing um, and did that work in several factories. Uh, spent some time in logistics and even some time in industrial performance, doing classical industrial engineering uh, work things like time studies and on different projects. And it was there that I said I could say that maybe I got discovered uh, by the HR world in that uh, a vice president of HR and logistics at Nestle at the time uh, started, uh, I don't know, kind of recruiting me and taking notice and mentoring me a little bit and pulled me into the function from there. It was in 2004, which was about two years after the acquisition of the old Ralston Purina company by Nestle, uh, that I was asked to come here to St. Louis and be the head of HR. And I've been here ever since. It's really been the best gig I've had um, in the company. So I decided to make it home. Um, and I've, I've been here since. And I love the company, love what I do. I love the team here. I love the mission. And it's, it's just been great. Fantastic. Well, it's quite rare in this day and age, actually, that we that we speak to a HR leader that's been in a, an organization as long as yourself, and that's testament to the business that you're well, in. That... <laughs> thank you. I hope you can sustain that. <laughs> <laughs> and uh, so for you, when you um, were initially exposed to HR, what was it about HR that really took your interest? You know, I, I have to say at the time, it was not pr the function in particular as as much as being offered a path to be developed and, and a leader that took an interest in me. I, I, you know, to this day, people I went to college with here, I, I have this job and they're like, you do what? Um, <laughs> let's just say I didn't have a standard <laughs> HR kind of personality. And uh, but, you know, at the time in our company, uh, things were being rationalized. It was it was early to mid 90s. Um, a, a lot of manufacturing in the United States in general, not just in Nestle, um, had too much capacity. So uh, there were less opportunities at the time in the traditional manufacturing career path. And along comes the set of HR. Ads, come on over here. We'll see what you can do. And and that's how it started. Um, although I I can looking back, and it's always this way. You can see things that led you to it and, and helped you develop a capacity for it and some understanding for it and some wisdom. And, and I can look back on things I did in the military and, and you know, even at the university and, and say, yeah, this, this prepared me for that. Mm -hmm. Fantastic. And where you are now, obviously, just a long journey. I'm sure you've seen the business go through different transformations and along that journey. What really occupies your mind on a day-to-day -day basis? Yeah, you know, overall, it's got to be the business. So uh, there's no particular pattern um, in an HR role. And uh, anyone in one of these jobs, is, you, you've probably heard that a million times. So I, I can't say there's one particular overwhelming thing in the function that that occupies my mind uh, on a daily basis. It, it's really sort of where's the business at? And then if you back away from that, uh, it's what am I doing to help? 
Uh, what problems <laughs> am I helping to solve? And, and I tell my team all the time, ultimately, we're here to solve problems. And if there's one thing then that, uh, that occupies my mind, that's it. Who are we helping? Uh, who mm -hmm. are we developing? What problems are we solving? And uh, how's it helping the business? And uh, like my biggest pet peeve is a recurring issue something that's just sort of keep keeps coming up over and over again that that really hasn't been dealt with um so i guess that's my lens uh on the day-to-day sure. -day question no i think that's a just that's a that's a that's a perfect answer you know looking at the business needs and then saying you know how in hr can we help the business achieve that so it's a, per it's a perfect answer so um, g give us a little bit, a bit of insight in terms of some of the work that you're doing now. Could you get, share one project or, or, or transformation that you're going through that you're that you're most proud of? Yeah, it's a good question, and and you know, uh, it's, it's sort of most proud of or or accomplishments, those kind of things. Everything we do uh, in human resources, I'll just say for me personally, it gets done with with other people. So uh, I'll t I'll give you a good one, but I, I have I have to say that. Uh, it's in concert with the leadership team of this company and a lot of others that we're doing this, but uh, we've, we've undertaken an effort to improve the agility of the organization like uh, probably every other large organization on the planet, uh, along with you know, scale and, and uh, bigness comes slowness and bureaucracy and mm -hmm. uh, the tendency to delay decisions. So we have an effort called Project Agility uh, that we're pursuing to, if I could put it in the, you know, the best simple way possible, I think we're trying to break up with 1990s business practices. Mm -hmm. And if you remember all those things that, that were sort of taught to us almost in an orthodox way that were good. And I, and I think a lot of it started with, uh, the re-engineering efforts of the 1990s. And, and there were a lot of efforts to, you put big teams together, they collect a lot of data, they meet for weeks and weeks or months on end, um, they work on org structure, uh, they collaborate, they argue points, what's the best way to do things, and then uh, they, they finally make a big presentation about how it should go and, uh, yeah. and to upper management, and then there's an approval, and then there's this stage rollout, and all that takes months, if not years. And I think we've seen in our industry uh, with small competitors, and it's not just us, this is happening everywhere, mm -hmm. um, across all industries, sectors, institutions, uh, small competitors are emerging and disrupting the, the large ones. And a lot of it is because of these institutionalized bureaucratic practices. And we're trying to divorce ourselves of those things. And when you think about it right now, data is available, <clears throat> excuse me, and facts are available on an almost instantaneous basis that inform decisions where it, back in 15, 20 years ago, that wasn't the case. So you needed these deliberative uh, long, you know, projects in order to pick direction. And I think it's quite different now. And if, if you're unwilling to move faster than that, I think you're going to be out of business. So this has been our, uh, this is what we've recognized as our issue to deal with. So we're, mm -hmm. we've got three or four streams of, of activity we're pursuing to change the behavior and the culture of the organization. And, uh, you know, there are things like owning decisions and not delaying decisions and understanding decision space. What am I allowed to do? What, what can I make the call on? And where, where can I move forward personally? There's uh, how we collaborate. Do we over collaborate and do we collaborate for the right reasons? Do we have too many meetings? Uh, are we having a meeting when we can pick up the phone or just have a conversation? Uh, there's uh, so these are sort of the streams of activity sure. that we're working on. Um, and it's it's simple um, and yet it's a concerted effort in the company. So my team's obviously uh, deeply involved in in this effort, but it, it involves the high commitment level of our whole leadership team to pick up the pace and the cadence of the organization, make decisions faster. Um, and we are seeing great results um, in, in multiple streams in the company from uh, practices and procedures that used to take weeks, now taking days. Um, and this is happening in every discipline you can think of, supply chain, procurement, different parts of manufacturing. We're communicating faster. We're sharing information faster. A lot behind that, but um, 
I'm excited about that. I, I think we're going to be able to make this thing, uh, this company, Purina, as fast as our small competitors uh, within a number of months. And, and I, I feel it coming. The, uh, my boss is excited about it and highly committed to it. And uh, it's, a, it's a good time to be here to watch it. No, amazing. Um, I can definitely relate to that for, for a, I had a sort of a, a few years in my career where I was building innovation events. So I was working with innovation directors from the largest companies in the world and uh, actually had a uh, private sort of uh, a meeting at Tesla. Uh, where mm-hmm. we had a sort of private tour of their of their facilities, and some in, and and uh, an insight into their mindset in terms of innovation and speed, and uh, it's, it was it was similar to what you're talking about now. All of those organizations were on a similar scale to to your own, and it was yeah. all about speed. You know, keeping up with the competitors. You know, by the time you make a decision, you may have already missed the boat. There you go. <laughs> uh, so so uh, it's great to hear that you guys are all, all, on that journey. Who are the stakeholders that are involved in that? It's the I, I would just call it our entire leadership team. We did this sure. together. Um, I have a great boss, and one of the things he agreed to, um, he he took over from a, another great boss that I had, a CEO that retired a few years ago. As he came on, uh, one of the great things he agreed to is that we were going to do some learning events together as a leadership team, uh, and and we've done some great ones over the years. Uh, one of the, the one that launched this was uh, we brought in a guy named Chris Fussell, who's the co-author of the book Team of Teams with Stanley McChrystal, uh, which was a bestseller in the United States. I think it is now, but starting a couple of years ago, we be- became cognizant of, of the book that addresses uh, dealing with disruptors, basically. And uh, we brought in Chris to talk to the leadership team uh, as a learning exercise. He spent a couple of hours um, uh, basically describing what's in the book with us in person. Um, my boss decided on the spot that this was a perfect allegory for uh, the situation we were dealing with in our industry with small competitors able to operate differently and quickly, uh, sometimes unregulated in a way that large companies are, and that we needed to deal with it right then and there. So we made a commitment to start pursuing it at that point. So in answer to your question, it really is the leadership team that that all of myself and all of my boss's direct reports were the stakeholders and were the ones who have to own it. Sure. And and what was the biggest challenge that you guys had to overcome? You know, I I what's good about this is the business is not in trouble. Um we're a successful company. Uh so this was this was out of aspiration, not desperation. And that's probably the biggest challenge, <laughs> you know, when oh, there's no burning platform to stand on that that's immediately evident. You know, we, sure. we best de- definitely have challenges and there's things that we, we'd like to do better. And we have a pretty honest culture uh, about those things. But getting the attention of the whole organization that this should be a priority and why uh, has taken us some time. Uh, but, I, you know, we're, we've dealt with that. And we've got momentum and we're moving forward. But to explain to everybody why we're doing this, why it's important, um, when we're in a, a pretty successful, good you know, business with good bones and, and, and good functions and uh, actually recognized in a lot of ways for, for being a great place, uh, you, you've got to work hard to get people's attention. Sure. I think that's also the mistake that a lot of companies make, though, that when things are going well, yes. they're not they're not innovating, they're not looking out there. And then when things when crisis hits, it's, it's, it's almost a it's a shock. Right. And you see it with many businesses going out of business, <laughs> uh, exactly. who are, you know, who are only months ago, very profitable and, and everything looked fantastic. So it's, it's good that you're shaping that into the culture of the business, which will take some time and it's going to be an ongoing activity. It's not going to be a project that you're going to solve overnight. Could you give me some examples of, of the ways that you engage the business and, sh- and deliver this message? Uh, yeah, I mean, multiple ways. I mean, obviously, you're going to use all of your, your company's communication vehicles. So, uh, you know, we've done everything from videos to emails and really super traditional things. And, and uh, we've even provided some documents to explain the project and how it applies to you personally. Um, probably the most powerful thing we've done was just done recently. We had a meeting with with all the directors in our company. So that's sort of like the upper middle management to uh, really address the need to have a sense of urgency about all this. My boss kicked it off. Um, and then we took 
about 12 executives from throughout the business who were early adopters of the principles, asked them to stand up and share a short testimonial about what they did uh, to become more agile in their area, um, how they applied it, and what the results have been. And uh, we videotaped the whole effort, uh, and uh, what we're going to do is actually share a, uh, a quick edited version of the meeting with the entire company. Uh, I think we'll have that ready to go next week. But I'd, I'd say that's the most powerful thing we've done as of yet. And to your point, this is a long-term effort. So we're really, sure. I'd say we're at the end of the beginning. <laughs> and um, that's, a good, love, that's a good way to yeah, put it. <laughs> your, your man Churchill has a great speech that <laughs> that has a number of references to that. But um, uh, we're, we've got a long way to go, but I, I think we're doing the right things to uh, to engage everybody right now. Mm -hmm. what, what are some of the results that you're seeing so far then? Um, well, let me give you a good one from my department we were just discussing yesterday. So uh, in our recruitment function, uh, we just performed for the month of August. Uh, we're going to come in at close to 60% of all hires were filled. It's zero days to fill. Okay? Wow. And uh, I, I recommend, if you can get on this podcast, there's a guy named John Sullivan um, who who's our recruiting um, thinker out in Silicon Valley. Uh, we've adopted a lot of his practices, but zero days to fill is, is, is achieved by finding people and getting them in the pipeline and getting them pre-interviewed and, and ready to be hired if and when a job becomes available instead of the normal way of doing it is waiting. being reactive <laughs> and waiting for yeah. somebody to show up and say, holy crap, Joe Blow quit. Now what do I do? Mm -hmm. So this happens through really good partnership and, and uh, collaboration across, across functions, obviously. So, um, and, and the use of uh, analytics to create a good forecast so that you can build the trust of the business leaders to say, hey, we're anticipating you're going to have X amount of turnover in your area this year, so why don't we just build the pipeline? Let's get going. Um, and to, to me, that's a great example of this. You think about um, all the time spent waiting in an open job situation. And there are tough to fill jobs, and if you wait till the person quits to, to find the next one, you're going for 60, 70 days of time to fill uh, or longer in, in some cases. So the sooner you get started on building a queue, um, the better it is for anticipated openings. So, so that's one from Human Resources. Things like that are happening all over our company. We're, we're, uh, uh, we're seeing... Uh, reduced approval times for materials and ingredients and procurement. Uh, I'm, I'm not going to throw out the specifics on that, but we're very sure. proud of them. Uh, what we're doing is questioning all of our big company stuff. Nothing that would involve safety or of, of our con ultimate consumers or pets, uh, but things that just were the way they were because we were in the pace of the 20th century. Mm -hmm. And we're going back and questioning all of it, and our, and our leaders are, are committed to doing it. So we're, we're seeing things like that. Uh, on, on the collaboration front, uh, we've instituted uh, very broad meetings for information sharing internally across functions um, and asking people to collaborate cross-functionally far more than they ever have before. Um, and uh, some of these meetings are yielding insights that allow us to just operate more efficiently generally speaking. I'm a little reluctant to get too specific um, because oh, sure. some of this stuff is, is proprietary and um, we're very proud of it and it's helping us be more effective and I don't want to tip off any of my <laughs> evil HR competitors that might no. be uh, listening, specifically from the pet industry. <laughs> sure, sure. No, I can, um, all the things you're doing sound fantastic and um, innovation is the game and it's speed, right? And making sure that you're constantly re um, looking at everything and saying and, and questioning, questioning Questioning yes. everything that you're doing and not getting in a position where you're just comfortable and you know you're going flo floating along by um is it has it been um, a challenge to get that that uh shift in mindset to, in the business especially where it's been embedded for so many years yeah uh, I, how, classic, how do you address that <laughs> sure it's classic change management i always view these things as a third a third and a third so as you as you undertake something like this yeah you have your early adopters then you have your wind checkers that are they're gonna stay in the middle and and try to determine are they really serious about this maybe i'll make a few token moves and and use some of the new vocabulary but i'll hope it goes away 
And then they're the, the staunch, I ain't doing this. This is stupid. I don't know what you guys are talking about. It doesn't work. We've never done this before. So we've, we've seen a fair amount of all of that. Um, but I, like I told you about this meeting we just had, I, I think we've incrementally increased the volume. We've incrementally continued to share the successes internally. Um, and now we've got this thing uh I think we've got almost all the rowers rowing, the, rowing in the right direction at this point. It takes a fair amount of patience, and the first phase of this thing was just making sure we had our act together as a leadership team at the beginning, and we spent a lot of time on that, um, clarifying decision rights, uh, making sure we were collaborating effectively, and making sure our meetings were efficient and not causing a need for redundancy or, or extra meetings, um, just getting into the basics. So, and we use the book team of teams as a guide. Um, so I'm a big fan of, of the ideas presented in that, uh, particular book. And, um, so far so good. Fantastic. Has this shift, um, of course, with any change, you're trying to build a, this, this culture within your organization. Um, has this affected your recruitment strategy in terms of the types of people that you're now, going after in terms Absolutely. of the talent to bring in a fresh perspective? It's a good, great question. I'd say more than ever, we're, we're um, cognizant that when there are emerging areas of and new skill sets, it, it, it's, and Dave Ulrich, who's been on your show, is a big proponent of this. It's faster to go find new capabilities than try to build them internally. And it doesn't mean you shouldn't do both. Sure. Um, I think in the past we'd be a lot more reluctant to go external uh, to to find emerging capabilities, but I can tell you at this point it's it's now an accepted part of life in our company that we're going to do that, and uh, we have to do it for our own survival. Uh, we've done that in the areas of e-commerce, um, digital marketing. Uh, I, I think uh, it's starting to spread throughout the company, and. Uh, it's been very beneficial to the company. So I, absolutely, big part of recruiting strategy. And we're, we're sort of, as I've told you, we're relooking at a lot of givens uh, that have been passed along for decades in terms of how things are done. Um, I, I'll say this, uh, for example, let's talk about MBAs. I've got an MBA. I believe in education. I think everybody should get as much as they, they can, and it's a good thing. But I'm not sure... Uh, that having a requirement for an MBA in a certain role uh, should be a given yeah. because it, it prevents you from getting diversity. It prevents you from uh, the traditional views on diversity in some regards, but it also prevents you from getting diversity of thought. And, you know, we've had sort of a reckoning inside our company that um, we need people from all skills, backgrounds, points of view, uh, Etc. in order to get the best thinking uh, to help us innovate. And I, I, we don't want to, you know, be too this type of educational background be, because ultimately it's, it's going to affect us. And I, I know of large CPG companies in the United States, for example, that would only hire uh, yes. MBAs from Yale and Harvard and other Ivy League schools uh, into their uh, – certain departments like marketing and they've failed and they've not done well and and uh they're under duress and uh this is our point of view it's not everyone's point of view and and we're not and I, listen i love mbas so don't get me wrong it's it's not that we're not going to hire them but we want to mix I'm so with you. That would be my uh, answer to that question. I think it's part of the, the innovation, the whole thing you're doing. That is also fundamentally part of that. Um, right. I didn't. I, I didn't go to university. I chose to just go straight into into the career and learn on the job. And um, if anything, I was fast tracked yeah. along that journey by living it <laughs> every single day yes. and being exposed, being exposed to it. And it was quite quite um, surreal when. Obviously, I started very young at 17 years old. By the time I was 23, I had a team of 20 people reporting into me, and every single one of those were university grads. Right. And <laughs> with, you know what, with, with what you're doing? You're, you're curious. So uh, just by doing these podcasts like you're doing, you're learning, and you're talking to knuckleheads like me, and <laughs> you come away with insights and, and trends, and you can look at all of us and, and look for the commonalities and the things that are different. Um, so there are multiple paths to success there there is never just one path and we all have to remember that yeah 
And um, it, going back to your point earlier about hiring new skills into HR, I'm seeing that more and more now. Even today on LinkedIn, right. I think I came across a uh, probably a twenty a mid twenty year old um, chief HR officer for a startup, or um, I think I saw uh, a global head of HR analytics for a for a FTSE 100 company and he looked no younger than he looked about 20 years old. <laughs> Good uh, for but, him. He, but you know, but he has though, <laughs> it, it, but he has that tech, tech, um, tech, uh, technical insights and knowledge sure. to be able to, um, go into HR and learn the soft skill of HR, but retain coming with the skills that he has. I think the other way around is very difficult to be a HR traditional HR leader and then learn, you know, the, the technical skills. It's just a lot more difficult, I think. I'm not saying it can't be done, but if yeah. you're trying to learn about analytics, data, coding, <laughs> um, at, at that age, it's just not possible. It, um, it, well, I would agree. <laughs> I've tried. I've tried. <laughs> it's very difficult. I tried, to, I tried for a very long time to learn how to code, and uh, <laughs> I give, I've given up now. Okay, yeah, no. we all have our gifts. <laughs> um, yeah. Well, in terms of skills, um, in your experience and what you're seeing now, what skills in HR do you think are going to be more important in the future and, and how are you guys currently preparing for that? Yeah, so uh, another writer, speaker, I, re I really like to follow. There's a guy named Bob Johansson. Uh, he, he works with the Institute for the Future, uh, which is out in California, uh, unsurprisingly. And uh, uh, we have him uh, speak to our emerging leaders uh, a couple times a, a year. Fascinating person to, look, to, to listen to. And um, you, you're familiar with this term VUCA. It describes no, our current. I'm not. Okay. Okay. So, so a lot of writers have come up with this. Uh, I think it originally came out of the Army War College uh, back around post 9/11. Uh, years ago, uh, and the, and the acronym stands for uh, volatility, uncertain, complex, and ambiguous. In terms of how the world is right now, mm -hmm. and, and we're certainly, you know, feeling that as a, as a large organization. And Bob talks about the, the leaders of the future uh, being uh, or, or needing to have the capability to turn that into his version of VUCA, which is um, providing vision, uh, understanding, clarity, and agility. And you think about that; it, it's another way of saying sort of being a rock in, in a time of uncertainty. Um, and not overreacting and providing calm. You know, my version of that, you know, in our company is to be curious externally, um, understand technology and always be trying to work with it. I was reflecting on, on our talk this morning and I was rem remembering, and I, you know, my early mentor in HR, uh, who I love the guy. He, he he taught me a lot, but he's kind of funny. And from a previous generation, he used to refer to his his laptop as the jukebox, and he'd barely use it. And he'd jokingly say, "Well, I got to go see what's going on with the jukebox," and <laughs> I don't want to be that guy. <laughs> um, to the millennials that I work with now, and I, I want to be savvy and understand uh, all the emerging tools and, and how they affect the business. So it's so critical right now. So I, I do think that's a critical one. I, I think you always have to be learning more than ever because things are, are changing so fast. So and these aren't things that are necessarily HR specific. I, I think they're, they're for everyone. Um, and maybe a couple just for HR specifically. I really am, uh, am a fan of Dave Ulrich and, and, of the competencies or capabilities he talks about, the one that is most critical for me in my role would be uh, this credible activist uh, term that he uses, which is, you know, uh, being able to be the one that either speaks truth to power or says the uncomfortable thing or yes. brings up the thing that we might be missing uh, that no one wants to bring up. Um, and sometimes you do it privately, sometimes you do it in a more public forum. Um, but to me, that's always been the one in eight. That's what you're there for. You know, and you, fa you look back on all the corporate scandals going back to Enron of the last 15 years. There was not an HR person in most of those companies that was a credible activist, my guess is, um, or they would have resigned. Um, and, and I think it's a, it's a critical piece of the role, and you got to have it. And the other one is being a good connector. Uh, who do people need to know? Who else needs to know? Who, who in their role could benefit by knowing someone else that you're aware of because of your uh, – uh, your position in the organization to look across it and, and how do you bring them together mm -hmm. fantastic and uh, I think uh, you know quite a few people brought up recently in terms of the, uh, the the courage to say to to have a voice 
yes. and to and to speak up, even when it is. If if anything, it's even more important when it's uncomfortable to have a voice. Uh, everyone can do well in their role when things are going great. I think it's how you react when things aren't going great, yeah. and and the ability to be courageous and take that risk and be heard. So there's a lot to be said for that. So appreciate you sharing that insight. Uh, in, in terms of the technology, you are definitely right. It's um, it's something that's coming, and there's no avoiding it. Uh, we've seen all of the all of the business units over the last sort of ten ten years go through it. You've gone, you know, you've got marketing going through the digital transformation, sales, the analytics has obviously impacted those. All, uh, finance has kind of always been there, <laughs> in right. a sense. They were the first guys there, and now we're seeing this with come and hit HR. Um, how have you prepared yourself for that? What are you doing to to um, upskill yourself and, and your team? Okay, so as a, as a leadership team, we've we've taken a trip to Silicon Valley. We've done a deep dive. Our parent company, Nestle, has uh, what they call the Silicon Valley Outpost uh, on a pier out in San Francisco, and and they regularly rotate groups out there to mix it up. Uh, with startups, and so we've done some pretty cool things in in that regard, um, and done some deep dives, uh, looking at where we might go, what we might use, uh, how things are, are are evolving. So in the HR discipline, I would tell you, I think in the future, a, a lot can be done with apps um, instead of enterprise software, and I really think there'll be some kind of a major disruption or shift in the next couple of decades in that regard. And our my company, you know, when I say that, I mean Nestle SA is paying close attention to all that as they should. Uh, what I do personally, um, you know, here's an example. I just switched completely out of taking notes in a sort of physical diary, which I had done for years. I, I kept those little, um, you know, eight-inch big notebooks with me everywhere I went to take notes. And I completely flipped got myself an iPad Pro and, and I'm using a simple uh, OneNote app that's a Microsoft app uh, just to take all my notes and, and uh, which is great. And most of them are, they're all the same. You know, they, oh, if, you, yeah. if you talk to people, they're very opinionated on this. I, I asked a few people, got a few recos and went with this one. But um, I, I do that now. And what's great about it, you used to worry about losing those notebooks or misplacing sure. them. Now, if it's on your iPad, at least it's going to be locked out even if you lose that so no one can get to your notes. But uh, uh, use WhatsApp a lot. I have a little WhatsApp channel for my HR leadership team so we communicate quickly. On, on things that need to be shared and sometimes a joke or, or nonsense, but um, <laughs> the tools there just for instantaneous communication, um, you know, and I, you, you just pay attention, you know, you pay attention to what's going on out in, in the world and make sure as things emerge, what's great, we have a great digital marketing group uh, here and I just make sure that uh, I keep them exposed to my team and as they stumble across new things, they teach them and, uh, I had someone come in and teach Snapchat to my leadership team. Uh, that's a that's a that's a funky one for someone in my I, generation. I wasn't, I wasn't expecting that <laughs> at all. <You're, laughs> that must have been a very interesting session. <laughs> yeah, it's not intuitive, and, and we, my theory is that's on purpose to keep the old guys out of it. But uh, yeah, um, we, we're we're trying to do things like that all the time, just to maintain a certain level of awareness and wherewithal. Um, and, and you know. I think we're in this waiting period for a lot of things. All these things that are being talked about, like driverless cars and AI and robots, et cetera, et cetera. Yeah. It, it's all coming, but we don't know how fast. And, and I think our job right now is uh, to be cognizant and aware and thinking about it and preparing for it. These kind of things could take Anywhere, there could be a massive breakthrough. Here it comes in two years, or there could be all kinds of litigation and craziness and 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 things that delay it, and it it ends up being ten or fifteen. Um, so you can't obsess over it too much. You know, like the gig economy is a, is a good example of this. We're we're in a relationship with Upwork. It's the biggest freelancer uh, app and site in in the U.S. We, we've had a visit with them. Uh, I believe in it. I, I think it's a nice tool. I think we have to be ready for it. It's not quite that popular yet, at least in our geographic region and in the way we do business. But I know we have to be ready for it. Can um, you give an example of what it is? Sorry, because I'm not aware of Upwork. that. Just briefly. Yeah. Okay. So Upwork is a community of freelancers. 
Okay. So uh, it's people who work from their homes or anywhere that, that you can uh, engage with So and, and ha- hire them to do gigs. So classic, okay. Okay. Uh, it's sort of like an Uber for anything. Sure, so, sure. Uh, it's a big, the biggest components of the community are probably, uh, it related and, uh, maybe a little bit on the creative side. Um, so, so uh, digital artists and so forth. Mm-hmm. So, uh, to the extent you need things like that, it's very robust, but, I, but almost every other type of job is going there. So for example, when you go to Upwork's headquarters and you go in their lobby, they have an iPad with a screen on it and their receptionist is there on that screen, but she's in Montana. Or some <laughs> state, and she's kind of running the office and buzzing people in and and doing all this stuff and and kind of a cool thing that that they do to showcase um, yeah. what exactly their mission is. But the, the question is, when is that going to become more prevalent? When is it going to happen? Um, I don't know. Uh, you know, we're we're pushing to to play around with it at this point. Um, I'd love to see more of it uh, happen in our company. Not quite there yet. Sure, sure. We're trying to pay attention though. No, definitely. I think no one really knows exactly what the impact's going to be, and as you said, when when it's going to happen. Um, right. And I think the biggest problem for, especially a lot of people in our community, is there's so much information out there. Yes. So much inf- you don't really know what to what to believe or what or, or, or how to prepare. I think the only thing you can do, as you said, is just make sure that you know at least you know that, that it is coming, and right. that, and to prepare as best as you can. Um, the good thing is, in the meantime, it's such an exciting time to be in HR. All of these new um, f- um, new skills that you're exposing to your teams, to the business, I can only imagine that that is it's uh, with the disruption. It's also brought along um, that whole new learning experience for the teams, and I can only imagine that's going to be a highly engaging journey. Okay, there are going to be stresses, of course, that come yeah. along with it, but it's also a fantastic way to, um, for team members to develop build new skills and find their path within the business as Agreed. well. So that's, it. yeah, so I, I honestly, um, I, I've been doing this for a long time since I was 17 and the last three, three to four years have been so exciting. There's such a big, big shift and it's only continuing. So it's, uh, yeah, it's, it, you're, either on, you're either on the bandwagon or you're not. There's no in between. I think you have to. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> um, one, one of the other things I want to ask you as well is um, within, within your business now, where do you, um, see the, the opportunity for improvement um, out, outside of technology whatever areas are you focusing on so as previously stated we have project agility so we're really working on our speed sure, sure. and our, our our adaptability and uh, those are the big ones uh, you know I, sure. I feel pretty confident in this organization um, you know once we figure that out I almost feel like there's nothing we can't do um, mm. and that's that's what we're trying to sort for the most part Fantastic. Well, that leads us nicely on to the quick fire round where I'm going to ask you five questions sure. and you have no more than 30 seconds to give us some amazing answers. Okay. <laughs> Are you ready? I'll do my best. <laughs> what was the number one thing that was holding you personally back from becoming a, a leader in the field of HR? Yeah, I, a tough one. I, You know, you're looking for self-disclosure, <laughs> which I'm not always the best at. Uh, I would tell you, um, like a lot of people, probably being too task-oriented and, and looking at what was right in front of me instead of um, doing a little bit more scanning and networking. And uh, sometimes that that can be a hindrance. If you sure. just work your butt off on the thing that you're, you're, you're right on, but you're, you're not really doing anything else, uh, there's multiple dimensions to the way we work, and early on, um, I needed to be uh, a little bit more aware of that. Okay, fantastic. Uh, what's the best piece of business advice that you've received? Easy. Um, I'd say what got you here won't get you there. And uh, <laughs> the the HR head at Nestle USA who promoted me to, to vice president told me that upon that promotion that, hey, Steve, you know, this is no longer about, you know, getting – projects done really really super well like you've been good at this is more about um leadership and and different things happen when you get to a certain level in the organization I, and i think that's true with every single new role or promotion that you you're you know able to enjoy when you get in the new job you've got to really take inventory and look at uh the things that have made you successful and whether they apply anymore and, and another mm-hmm. great writer marshall goldsmith 
wrote a book by that name. What got you here won't get you. I there. was going to say that because I've yeah. worked with Marshall in the past. <laughs> yeah, he's done Great a few guy. sessions. Yeah, he's he's. I'm sure you've heard his uh, air mile story on the plane. If you've ever spent any time with him, he's got a number of stories that he loves to tell. Yeah, we had him again. speak here to our really? executives about five <laughs> years ago, and it was a memorable uh, occasion for sure. Yeah, he's a great guy. But that's um, my most frequently gifted book that I give to our uh, different people who have been promoted because it's so spot on. Fantastic. Um, what's the um, – oh, okay, I was about to ask a book. Uh, what was your favorite book, and uh, what would you recommend to our audience and why? <laughs> I can give you a, a couple more. I'd, I'd also sure. say there's one called The Obstacle is the Way by a guy named Ryan Holiday. It's a, it's a book about perseverance and resilience. He quotes a lot of ancient Stoics in it, really like that. And uh, just for young people on the way up, um, this is a little more philosophical, but one called Man's Search for Meaning uh, by Viktor Frankl. And he was a guy who survived the Holocaust, and uh, his main insight was that life was all about finding meaning. And uh, it's, it's not a long read either, and uh, it's profound. Fantastic. And uh, I think we touched on this a bit earlier, but uh, what internet resources do you use to sort of keep up to date with current events or increase your productivity? Yeah, I think uh, a notes app, certainly, and an iPad. Um, I, I'd, I'd add to it as I as I evolve here, I'm, I'm using Twitter a little bit more to do quick scanning. Um, and uh, just when I get up in the morning, I'm likely to check my Twitter feed just for headlines and business uh, things that are happening. Okay. And uh, what's one thing um, about your business that most excites you? I know you're probably going to go back to what you mentioned earlier. <laughs> no, you know what? I'll, I'll give you a couple others. So we, we, in the last couple of years, have introduced some pretty exciting innovations. So one of them was a cat litter, believe it or not, that weighs less than half as much as traditional litter and it solved a big problem for people purchasing that stuff uh, and getting it to their car and it also can be shipped via e-commerce uh, that was an incredible breakthrough and it's the sort of innovation where there's a before and after um, another one a couple of years ago was called uh, it was a, a, an extension of our pro plan brand called bright minds and it's got some proprietary ingredients in it uh, that help older dogs cognition and my dearly departed Siberian Husky sweetie was on it for a couple of years as she got older and I saw an, an amazing transformation she actually learned how to open doors at the tender age of 13 and wow. uh, uh, it is a breakthrough product it, so what excites me the most is I know we have three or four more of those in the pipeline that I won't tell you what they are but uh, we have an <laughs> uh, amazing R&D function in this company and I uh, just look forward to seeing how we're able to uh, make people's actually make the lives of people's pets better in the future fantastic and I think certainly with the shift in mindset you have in the business you're going to be producing a lot more of those products in the future that's, so what we're that's pr pretty amazing well look Steve you've given us some great actionable advice and uh, I know our members will be a lot better off for it so thank you very much for that um, give our listeners, if there's a message you want to put, sort of put out to, to other HR leaders, what would that be? Give our listeners a sort of a parting piece of guidance. Just real simple, help others. You know, I, I think it's the ultimate job of leaders and HR people, maybe even more so than everybody else. You got to help people every single day and find ways to do it. Sometimes no one will ever know. Sometimes they will. Um, sometimes it's telling someone the truth. Sometimes it's overtly helping someone who's in a bad situation. Uh, but to me, all of that comes back to you in life if you do it and, and you have to find some way to do it every single day. Fantastic. And what would be the best way for our members to, to reach out to you? Hit me up on LinkedIn um, and that's probably the best way. Love to hear mm -hmm. from everybody. Fantastic. Well, look, again, thank you for joining us. Um, guys, make sure you head over to hrdleaders.com. You will find all the show notes from the episode everything we're talking about links to all of the books and uh, that were mentioned um, Steve thank you again for sharing the journey with us and uh, I wish you all the best until we next speak thank you Chris enjoyed it <laughs>